Hi, this is Miles Marie, the soldier of Mary. Today, I want to look at why you should not chew the Blessed Sacrament. I want to show how chewing the Blessed Sacrament is something that came in after a false theology around the Blessed Sacrament arose, that it's grounded in a false understanding of sacred scripture, and that all of the saints that had any devotion to the Blessed Sacrament swallowed the Blessed Sacrament as quickly as they could after receiving him. That's what I'm going to look at in this video. There's going to be a lot of evidence. Hopefully it won't be a hugely long video, but let's see how it goes. Okay, the first thing I want to look at is a journal article by the Catholic scholar Margaret McGuinness. So she begins by telling us how back in the 1920s, the standard books for children on reception of the Blessed Sacrament all emphasized the importance of receiving our Lord kneeling down, obviously, on the tongue, obviously, in the state of grace, obviously, with clean face, properly dressed, not pushing forward. But also they emphasized that the person who received the Blessed Sacrament on his or her tongue ought to close their mouth quickly, then swallow the Blessed Sacrament as soon as possible, so that the host does not dissolve, only dissolves when it reaches the stomach. First of all, she cites a book by Monsignor Schutz in the 1920s, and then afterwards, a Father Miller, a Redemptorist priest. He has a pamphlet entitled The Why and How of Holy Communion. And he makes some really good points again in his pamphlet. He, he emphasizes how everything about one's person, your clothing, demeanor, posture, attitude, it should all express the interior respect and reverence for Christ in the Eucharist. This is something that's been seems to have been forgotten nowadays. Furthermore, he says that Holy Communion is not actually received until the host is swallowed. Our Lord said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have eternal life. It is the eating, that is the swallowing of the elements, that is communion, not merely having them in your mouth. So Margaret McGuinness demonstrates how prior to the 1960s, this was the teaching that children were given. This was the catechetical instruction. It was based on a profound understanding of the Blessed Sacrament, and it meant that you should swallow the Blessed Sacrament as soon as you were able to. In the 1960s, things started to change in the catechetical world, and mainly it seems through articles in the popular liturgical journal, Worship. And this, I think, still exists to this day. It was influential with clergy and catechists. And authors in this journal began to say that the whole communion etiquette needed to go. That the Eucharist was a meal and there should be a more relaxed attitude. That was the guiding thread. And part of this meant, just like you chew your sandwich, the Holy Communion should be understood as food. Holy food that should be eaten like any other piece of food. Authors of a 1974 catechism write that children should be taught in the following manner. Jesus wants to give us a very special gift of food, the very same food that is that Jesus Christ gave to his special friends the night before he died. Okay, so let me get this straight, and maybe you've realized this. The importance of swallowing rather than chewing the Blessed Sacrament came from a period of proper theology around the Blessed Sacrament, a real theology. If you go down the road of saying the Mass is just a meal, then it seems to me that then anything goes. The Mass, first and foremost, is a sacrifice. And the communion is a union with the person of Christ, a living person, not some inanimate food that has a magic quality, a holy piece of bread. It's intimate union with a person who wants to talk to you, who wants to be with you and spend time with you. Okay, so at this point, I need to change track. That's the first part of this video. The second part now. Responding to the challenge from biblical, so-called biblical scholars and so-called theologians that have been saying that chewing the Blessed Sacrament is actually a good, a biblical thing. It's the right thing to do. Okay, so here is the interlinear New Testament, looking at Greek, looking at English. Okay, so we can see that in John chapter 6, we're going through John chapter 6 here, where Jesus talks, our blessed Lord talks about the bread of life. When he's talking about the bread of life, he gets to the point where he explains to the Jews that unless you eat my flesh 
and drink my blood, you cannot have life in you. Okay, so Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, if not, you shall have eaten the flesh of the Son of Man and shall have drunk of him the blood, not you have life in yourselves. And in this one, this particular word is used to describe eating, which comes from the Greek word phago. But then later on, we have this other word, and this is the one that people go on about. They say here, this is the evidence. Later on, our Yord says, the one eating of me, the flesh, and drinking of me, the blood, has life eternal. And he uses this word trogon, trogon. And the argument goes that our Lord is here using a word that describes a munching, chewing. And so our Lord is saying, the one who chews the flesh of the Son of Man has life in him. That's what we will argue. So let's look at this particular verb in the Greek. So here we are. Here is the next page of the analysis. So here we go. Trogo. Definition. To gnaw, to munch, to crunch. Okay, and that's where a lot of people will stop. They'll stop at that point. But actually, that's not how it's used. The usage of the verb in the New Testament, we can see this in the only other instance that the word is used in the New Testament is in Matthew 24, 38, where it talks about, this is where our Lord talks about uh, when the flood came, people were eating and drinking right before the flood came. It's not emphasizing that they were chewing something and drinking. They were eating a meal. They, will be, they were eating and drinking right until the flood came. So in the New Testament, the word is being used as generally eating and drinking. In the classical world, down here, it shows us some classical uses, usages of the word. And sure, in the classical world, in Homer's Odyssey, it was being used of animals feeding and it was being used of to describe chewing or crunching things. But in other parts of the classical world, as it says here, it's just used to eat absolutely. For example, it shows, we've just seen that, Matthew a second ago, but all these other references, it's just used as eat, just as another word to eat, not with this dimension of chewing. When you look at every single person who is translating John chapter 6 verse 54, all of these, these translators from the Greek which we've got on Bible Gateway, none of the learned translators from the Greek think that this word is correctly translated here or more adequately translated here as chew, as gnaw. Every single one of them thinks that this word is correctly translated as eats. Throughout the New Testament, the word is not used in any situation to refer to chew. In fact, there is one word that is used explicitly to refer to chew, and that is this one, which we have written here, masaome, which is used to refer to bite or chew. And it's clearly being used in the book of Revelation to refer to gnawing or chewing. It's only used once in the New Testament. If our Lord really wanted us to, to think of, of gnawing, then he would have used this word. At the Last Supper, our Lord uses the general one, Fago, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body. The Catholic Encyclopedia argues that our Lord probably used that more graphic, Rogo, to emphasize the literality of the eating dimension, that you actually are having to eat our Lord's flesh. It's not merely something symbolic. That's what the Catholic Encyclopedia says. It doesn't draw any conclusions that you need to gnaw or chew the Blessed Sacrament because this word trogon is used. Of course not. That idea seems to have been invented perhaps in the last 50 years or so. Okay, so that's the biblical side of things that I wanted to present. Now the next part of this talk, which is the theological base, this is the most important part, why chewing the Blessed Sacrament is so spiritually immature to chew the Blessed Sacrament for a really clear reason that I want to go into now. Okay, and that reason is, referring here now to the Council of Trent, the session on the Blessed Sacrament, the Council of Trent tells us Jesus is to be adored in the Blessed Sacrament and just so long as he remains present under the appearances of bread and wine, Namely, from the moment of transubstantiation to the moment in which species are decomposed. Our Lord is to be adored while the appearances of bread and wine remain. Once the appearances, the evident manifest qualities of bread 
and wine have gone, then our Lord is no longer to be adored because our Lord is no longer present. So this means that if you receive our Lord into your mouth and then chew away, the sacred species are decomposed very quickly. Very, very quickly. So you are eliminating the real presence of Christ in you as soon as he's entered inside of you. That is why, and I want to show from the saints in a minute, why all the saints, our Lord was placed upon their tongue, then as soon as they were able, they swallowed the blessed sacrament whole and entire so that the sacred species would not decompose so quickly so our Lord's physical presence would be inside of them for as long as possible. I'm going to read a few quotes from different saints now. St. Teresa of Avila, she says to her spiritual daughters, Let us entertain ourselves lovingly with Jesus and not waste the hour that follows communion. As we know that the good Jesus remains within us until our natural warmth has dissolved the bread-like qualities, we should take care not to lose so beautiful an opportunity to treat with him and lay our needs before him. Some saints, St. Therese of Lazure, for instance, she gained the grace, the awesome grace of our Lord telling her that the sacred species would remain preserved in her and would not decay. And again, he said this to St. Faustina in her diary. She writes, I've come to know that Holy Communion remains in me until the next Holy Communion. A vivid and clearly felt presence of God continues in my soul. My heart is a living tabernacle in which the living host is reserved. St. Anthony Mary Claret also writes, When I was praying in the Church of the Rosary, our Lord granted me the grace of retaining the sacramental species. Day and night I have the most holy sacrament in my breast. For this reason, I must always be recollected and devoted to him who abides so intimately within me. This is also an occurrence in the life of St. Margaret Mary, St. Gertrude the Great. This would never have been possible had they chewed the Blessed Sacrament and eliminated the physical presence of Christ within them so quickly. The saints swallowed the Blessed Sacrament as soon as possible. I actually think that this miracle of preservation happens more often than we are aware. It's probably the case in all of the saints or any of the saints who have been absorbed in prayer for a sustained period of time after Holy Communion. And for example, I read that St. John of Avila, St. Ignatius Loyola, St. Aloysius Gonzaga, St. Padre Pio, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Louis de Montfort, St. Alphonsus de Liguri, all of them were absorbed in prayer. And St. Philip Neri, they were all absorbed in prayer for like an hour after receiving the Blessed Sacrament. I'm sure in all of those cases, these saints quite obviously swallowed the Blessed Sacrament quickly, and then that Blessed Sacrament remained in them whole and entire for perhaps an hour, perhaps two hours. But ordinarily, ordinarily, it takes 15 minutes for the Blessed Sacraments to dissolve within you and for the real presence to disappear. At the very least, we should maintain a thanksgiving of 15 minutes of intimate prayer after receiving Holy Communion. St. Joseph Cotolengo, he personally used to oversee the baking of hosts for Mass and Communion. And he gave the following advice to the sister who was doing the baking. He said, make the host sick so that I can linger a long time with Jesus. I do not want the sacred species to be quickly consumed. If St. Joseph was just chewing the Blessed Sacrament, that that request would be completely wasted because our lord's real present would have disappeared very very quickly after reception these 15 minutes during which jesus is physically present inside of you they are the they are heavenly moments that should never be wasted and this is only possible if you do not chew the blessed sacrament okay a few points from the visions now at garabandao the mystical communions, the children received the host on their tongue, they closed their mouth, then they swallowed. The Milagruco, 
the Conchita received on her tongue, the visible appearance of the Blessed Sacrament on her tongue. She didn't chew the Blessed Sacrament. She swallowed. And the angel instructed the children to do this. He instructed them on the correct way to receive Holy Communion. He instructed them that they should swallow the Blessed Sacrament as soon as they could so that our Lord would remain inside of them. All of the mystics who have received Holy Communion in this mystic manner None of them do we see mystically chewing. Imagine seeing that. None of them do that. They all swallow the host that has appeared on their tongue and that only they are able to feel. So let's conclude this video now. The idea that it's okay to chew the Blessed Sacrament, it arose from a false and misleading emphasis that the Mass is just a meal and that the, the Blessed Sacrament is just a piece of holy bread a piece of food to be eaten. The children ought not to be afraid of Christ's awesome, powerful presence in the Blessed Sacrament, but they should be more laid back and at ease. All that this catechetical approach brought about was lapsation and lack of belief in the truth of the Blessed Sacrament, a rejection of the fundamental truth that we express our adoration through our bodies, our movements, our gestures. We aren't angels. We've got bodies, and if someone casually walks up, takes our Lord's sacred body in his grubby hands, munches away at it like he's eating a biscuit, and then walks back to his seat, sits down, checks his watch, that doesn't express Catholic belief, and it doesn't encourage others in belief. Downcast faces, kneeling down, receiving upon the tongue, allowing yourself to swallow as soon as you are able, humble and slow return to the pew, then kneeling down and speaking to Jesus with your face in your hands. That expresses Catholic belief and that encourages others in the faith. That teaches our children more than a hundred hours of catechism. And then enjoying at least 15 minutes of intimate conversation with our Lord while his Eucharistic species dissolves in your stomach. I've said enough. I hope I've said enough. We need a Eucharistic revolution, a rediscovering of the faith of the real presence and all our behaviours and our attitudes need to be re-examined in light of this. Maybe like me, some of you return to your Catholic faith and, and maybe like me, you were given this bad catechesis when you were young and maybe like me, you thought, you know, you never even thought yourself anything about chewing the Blessed Sacrament re-examine everything re-examine everything i think that this is the first video on youtube telling you that you should not chew the blessed sacrament that at best it's a spiritually immature practice and at worst it's publicly irreverent and a poor expression of the true eucharistic faith change if you've been chewing the blessed sacrament change from now on Receive our Lord with utmost reverence, swallow him as soon as you are able, and enjoy the time of thanksgiving when he is inside of you for at least 15 minutes. Follow the example of the saints, not the poor catechists that have misled you for these last 50 years. Follow the saints. May Almighty God bless you. May Our Lady intercede for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.